The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger To My Mother Chapter 1 If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap, but I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. In the first place, that stuff bores me. And in the second place, my parents would have about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. They're quite touchy about anything like that, especially my father. They're nice and all. I'm not saying that, but they're also touchy as hell. Besides, I'm not going to tell you my whole goddamn autobiography or anything. I'll just tell you all about this madman stuff that happened to me around last Christmas, just before I got pretty run down and had to come out here and take it easy. I mean, that's all I told DB about, and he's my brother and all. He's in Hollywood. That isn't too far from this crummy place, and he comes over and visits me practically every weekend. He's going to drive me home when I go home next month, maybe. He just got a Jaguar, one of those little English jobs that can do around 200 miles an hour. It costs him damn near 4,000 bucks. He's got a lot of dough now. He didn't used to. He used to just be a regular writer when he was home. He wrote this terrific book of short stories, The Secret Goldfish, in case you've never heard of him. The best one in it was The Secret Goldfish. It was about this little kid that wouldn't let anybody look at his goldfish because he'd bought it with his own money. It killed me. Now he's out in Hollywood, DB, being a prostitute. If there's one thing I hate, it's the movies. Don't even mention them to me. Where I want to start telling is the day I left Pensy Prep. Pensy Prep is this school that's in Agerstown, Pennsylvania. You've probably heard of it. You've probably seen the ads anyway. They advertise in about a thousand magazines, always showing some hot shot guy on a horse jumping over a fence. Like, as if all you ever did at Pensy was play polo all of the time. I never even once saw a horse anywhere near the place. And underneath the guy on the horse's picture, it always says, since 1888, we've been molding boys into splendid, clear-thinking young men. Strictly for the birds. They don't do any damn more molding at Pensy than they do at any other school. And I didn't know anybody there that was splendid and clear-thinking and all. I mean, maybe two guys, if that many. And they probably came to Pensy that way. Anyway, it was the Saturday of the football game with Saxon Hall. The game with Saxon Hall was supposed to be a very big deal around Pensy. It was the last game of the year, and you were supposed to commit suicide or something if old Pensy didn't win. I remember around 3 o'clock that afternoon, I was standing way the hell up on top of Thompson Hill, right next to this crazy cannon that was in the Revolutionary War and all. You could see the whole field from there, and you could see the two teams bashing each other all over the place. You couldn't see the grandstand too hot, but you could hear them all yelling deep and terrific on the Pensy side because practically the whole school except me was there and scrawny and faggy on the Saxon Hill side. Because the visiting team hardly ever brought many people with them. There were never many girls at all of the football games. Only seniors were allowed to bring girls with them. It was a terrible school, no matter how you looked at it. I like to be somewhere, at least, where you can see a few girls around once in a while, even if they're only scratching their arms or blowing their noses or even just giggling or something. Old Selma Thurmer. She was the headmaster's daughter, showed up at the games quite often, but she wasn't exactly the type that drove you mad with desire. She was a pretty nice girl, though. I sat next to her once in the bus from Agerstown, and we sort of struck up a conversation. I liked her. She had a big nose, and her hair, her nails were all bitten down and bleedy looking, and she had those damn falsies that point all over the place, but you sort of felt sorry for her. What I liked about her, she didn't give you a lot of horse manure about what a great guy her father was. She probably knew what a phony slob he was. 
The reason I was standing way up on Thompson Hill instead of down at the game was because I just got back from New York with the fencing team. I was the goddamn manager of the fencing team. Very big deal. We'd gone into New York that morning for this fencing meet with McBurney School, only we didn't have the meet. I left all of the foils and the equipment and stuff on the goddamn subway. It wasn't all my fault. I had to keep getting up to look at this map so that we'd know where to get off. So we got back to Pensy around 2.30 instead of around dinner time. The whole team ostracized me the whole way back on the train. It was pretty funny in a way. The other reason I wasn't down at the game was because I was on my way to say goodbye to old Spencer, my history teacher. He had the gripe, and I figured I probably wouldn't see him again until Christmas vacation started. He wrote me this note saying he wanted to see me before I went home. He knew I wasn't coming back to Pensy. I forgot to tell you about that. They kicked me out. I wasn't supposed to come back after Christmas vacation on account of I was flunking four subjects and not applying myself and all. They gave me frequent warning to start applying myself, especially around midterms, when my parents came up for a conference with old Thurmer, but I didn't do it, so I got the axe. They give guys the axe quite frequently at Pensy. It It has a very good academic rating, Pensy. It really does. Anyway, it was December and all, and it was cold as a witch's teat, especially on top of that stupid hill. I I only had on my reversible and no gloves or anything. The week before that, somebody had stolen my camel's hair coat right out of my room with my fur-lined gloves right in the pocket and all. Pensy was full of crooks. Quite a few guys came from these very wealthy families, but it was full of crooks anyway. The more expensive a school is, the more crooks it has. I'm not kidding. Anyway, I kept standing next to that crazy can and looking down at the game and freezing my ass off. Only I wasn't watching the game too much. What I was really hanging around for... I was trying to feel some kind of a goodbye. I mean, I've left schools and places I didn't know I was even leaving them. I I hate that. I don't care if it's a sad goodbye or a bad goodbye, but when I leave a place, I like to know I'm leaving it. If you don't, you feel even worse. I was lucky. All of a sudden, I thought of something that helped make me know I was getting the hell out. I suddenly remembered this time in around October that I and Robert Tishner and Paul Campbell were chucking a football around in front of the academic building. They were nice guys, especially Tishner, but it was just before dinner and it was getting pretty dark out, but we we kept chucking the ball around anyway. It kept getting darker and darker and we could hardly see the ball anymore, but we didn't want to stop doing what we were doing. Finally, we had to. This teacher that taught biology, Mr. Zambezi, stuck his head out of this window in the academic building and told us to go back to the dorm and get ready for dinner. If I get a chance to remember that kind of stuff, I can get a goodbye when I need one. At least most of the time I can. As soon as I got it, I turned around and started running down the other side of the hill toward old Spencer's house. He didn't live on the campus. He lived on Anthony Wayne Avenue. I ran all the way to the main gate, and then I waited a second till I got my breath. I have no wind, if you want to know the truth. I'm quite a heavy smoker. For one thing, that is, I used to be. They made me cut it out. Another thing, I grew six and a half inches last year. That's how I practically got TV and came out here for all these goddamn checkups and stuff. I'm pretty healthy, though. Anyway, as soon as I got my breath back, I ran across Route 204. It was icy as hell, and I damn near fell down. I don't even know what I was running for. I mean, I guess I just felt like it. After I got across the road, I felt like I was sort of disappearing. It was like, it was that kind of a crazy afternoon, just terrifically cold and no sun out or anything, and you felt like you were disappearing every time you crossed a road. Boy, I rang that doorbell fast when I got to old Spencer's house. I was really frozen. My ears were hurting and I could hardly move my fingers at all. Come on, come on, I said, 
right out loud, almost, somebody opened the door. Finally, old Spencer opened it. They didn't have a maid or anything, and they always opened the door themselves. They didn't have too much dough. Holden, Mrs. Spencer said, how lovely to see you. Come in, dear. Are you frozen to death? I think she was glad to see me. She liked me. At least, I think she did. Boy, did I get in that house fast. How are you, Mrs. Spencer? I said, how's Mr. Spencer? Let me take your coat, dear, she said. She didn't hear me ask how her, uh, how Mr. Spencer was. I mean, she was sort of deaf. She hung up my coat in the hall closet, and I sort of brushed my hair back with my hand. I wear a crew cut quite frequently, and I never have to comb it much. How have you been, Mrs. Spencer? I said again, only louder so she'd hear me. I've been just fine, Holden. She closed the door. How have you been? The way she asked me, I knew right away old Spencer told her I'd been kicked out. Fine, I said. How's Mr. Spencer? Is he over his gripe yet? Over it? Holden, he's behaving like a perfect, I don't know what. He's in his room, dear. Go right in. 